Okay, good evening, everybody. This is July the 5th, uh, Sunday, and this is our Sunday night lesson. As many of you know, tonight will be the beginning of us meeting on Sunday nights. Very excited about this, that we can begin a step in the right direction. I appreciate the elders for their decision uh, and their consistent guidance through this trying time. Um, I said this on Wednesday, but I do want to reiterate it. Let's continue to support and pray for them um, as this is such an odd period of time in our life. I, I often think, man, for years and years, my kids will study about 2020 when they get to school and uh, we'll tell grandkids about 2020. This will be a year that, um, you know, is unparalleled, I think, in history. And so, um, you know, living in the midst of it can be difficult, but uh, we have the blessing of technology. And then, of course, we've got the blessing of meeting together tonight. So uh, looking forward to seeing all of those who will be here. Please try to be here if you can. Um, and uh, we would love to be able to see you and spend time with you tonight um, or whenever you are kind of in the, in the swing to be able to come out, um, you feel comfortable, uh, I would I would love to see every one of you. I've seen a lot of folks, and it's been really good so far. So uh, Sunday night, tonight, we're going to continue our study on Proverbs. Now, uh, our study on Proverbs tonight, as you remember last Sunday night, we took ourselves into a study of uh, friendship and what the Bible has to say about friendship in the book of Proverbs and how, you know, we need to maintain friendships and how to be good friends and, you know, how to, how to, uh, deal with conflict within friendships. There's a lot that Proverbs has to say about being a friend, and, and that's an important uh, passage. You know, the Bible does tell us there in the book of Proverbs, if a man, uh, you know, is going to have friends, he needs to first be friendly, and uh, so that's an important part of being a friend. Now, the Bible in the book of Proverbs doesn't just talk about friendships. It also talks about the relationship of families relationship of families. And so that's what we're going to study tonight. We're going to be talking about families and building up our families. As you can see the title of the lesson, A House Built by Wisdom, What Proverbs Has to Say About Families. As you can probably guess, there's a lot in the book of Proverbs about families. Uh, there are some areas that we'll not explore. Uh, we are going to talk about child rearing as part of uh, our topical study in the book of Proverbs, so I'm not going to address kind of the discipline passages and, and raising children. We'll overlap some of that here, but um, we're not going to kind of go into that realm so much as, as much as we're just going to talk about the whole family unit, and uh, so I hope you enjoy this study through the book of Proverbs. Now, as we begin, it's important for me to note out, uh, you know, as we start, a couple of things. First off, I think all of us know that life is very short. Uh, it's shorter for some than others. Uh, you know, there are some people that live well into their 90s and uh, even some on our earth that make it into the hundreds of years of life. Um, while some are taken from this earth very early. So life varies, but even at the longest point, you know, if you live into your 80s and 90s, life is still very short. It's not uh, just this drawn out process where you just get a ton of redos and and life just goes by very quickly and it's short. Our eternal existence as people is greatly influenced by how we live during that short life. And so we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to be prepared for eternity. Um, we can't waste our time in this short life making foolish and rash decisions, um, irrational decisions based on feelings and emotions we have to make the right decision because if, if we live our life making bad decisions or not really taking care in our decision making, it could jeopardize our eternal destiny. And, uh, you know, even it could make our life miserable. And so, you know, we need to make sure that during this short life, we're making good decisions. Now, the value of wisdom is what the book of Proverbs is about and making valuable decisions and using wisdom in life is going to help us ultimately get to eternity the value of wisdom is seen in life in general, but I think the book of Proverbs has a great focus on the value of wisdom within the family. The life that we live as individuals is short, but when you begin to talk about the life you have with family, you go through stages of where your family changes. Those stages are very short, and so we want to make the best we can of the time we have 
with our families. We all know families grow too quickly. Um, they change rapidly. The nature and the dynamics of our family change rapidly. Uh, great grandparent or grandparents become great grandparents. Parents become grandparents. Children become parents and have children of their own. And, and the stages of life move quickly. And so we want to do everything we can to take the advice of the book of Proverbs and not do a family by trial and error but use the wisdom in the book of Proverbs to help raise our families. There are so many experts about the family out there that call themselves experts that we want to just turn to God's word and find the truth about families there. So how do we build our houses on wisdom? That's what the book of Proverbs has to say to me. A couple of passages we'll look at before uh, we get into our three points this evening. The first one is Proverbs 24 verses three through four, where Solomon says this, by wisdom, a house is built. That's where our title of our lesson comes from. And by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. I love that first statement. By wisdom, a house is built. That's what we want to do. We want to build our homes on wisdom. And the book of Proverbs is the best place that we could turn. Proverbs 15 and verse 7. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. We're going to dive into this some tonight, but it's important for you and I to note that the most important thing about a home is not what's in the home. It's about what makes the home. That is, it's not about the things that, that fill up the spaces and rooms and about the things that are in the cupboards and the clothes that we wear and the possessions we have. A home, a family is much more than that. And so he says there in Proverbs 15, it's better to have a little where love is than to have a lot where hatred is. That is, we want our families to be built on love and we want them to be nurtured and cared for. And so I've got three things that I've noticed in the book of Proverbs, three important principles that I want to bring out about how our homes are built on wisdom that may help all of us. Everybody's home is different. So I'm hoping these three can kind of fit into everyone's life. You know, we began to talk about raising children or spouses. Everyone's home is different. Not everyone has a spouse, not everyone has children. So homes can be different, but I hope these three points will, will touch on and hit every type of home that we may have here at Bowden. So let's begin. Our first point is this, a godly home that is built on wisdom is first and foremost, a support system. Now, I was actually kind of surprised that this ended up being my first point. I didn't expect to find this idea within the book of Proverbs, but as I began to search, this is what I found more than anything else, was that a home needed to be a support system. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, think about what the Bible says about support. God created us not as people who would live on an island all by ourselves and never be around anyone, God created man, and remember he looked down on Adam when it was just Adam and the animals. He's like, man, Adam needs a helper. He needs somebody to be there with him, and so he created Eve, and they were companions together, and they made a family. Everybody needs companionship, and they need people around them to make their life and their home supported and loved, and that's what the Bible constantly teaches us. Like here in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 12, though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. One man can't stand all by himself and conquer everything life throws at him. He needs to have a support system around him. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew, 25 and verse, uh, Matthew 12 and verse 25. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. As we talk about the home, Matthew 12 and verse 25 always comes to my mind as if we're going to have godly homes, they have to meet this standard. Everyone needs to be working in the right direction. You can't have a group of people that have no support system. Everybody's against each other and nobody's supporting or encouraging or lifting each other up. Matthew 12, 25 says a house that's divided against itself, it's not going to stand long. It can't, it can't sustain itself. And so Matthew 12 teaches me that need for support, especially in the home, or it will not stand. And it, we see this in organizations and churches. You know, you've got to have a consistency, a coherence among people, that, that community that God uh, kind of put within each one of us, that we, we need that and we want it. 
Listen to how, how Paul describes the church needing to be a support system. He says this, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. How does the church support each other? Well, it does it this way. The church admonishes the idol. Our sermon this morning, we talked about the idea of admonishing people or uh, giving admonition to others. It's a warning. You know, if somebody's idle and not doing anything, what's the support system of the church supposed to do? Admonish them, warn them. Don't be idle anymore. Don't be lazy. You know, if people get lazy in their faith, it's the responsibility of the church to be that support system. A support system isn't always needed when things are going great. <laughs> Sometimes the support system is there to catch you when things start going bad. And so the church, it, it works as that support system. Brothers, admonish the idol. Anybody being idle and getting lazy in their spiritual life, admonish them. Encourage the faint-hearted. People that are faint-hearted and they're just exasperated and they're exhausted and they don't seem like they can go on, encourage them. Lift them up. He says, help the weak. Sometimes as people in, in our situations in life, we have the ability to do something that someone else may not. And so if they're weak in that area, we should help them in that area. You see, that's the support system of the church. Be patient with every person. Don't repay evil for evil, but seek to do good to one another and to everyone. That's the idea of the support system of the church. So all throughout the Bible, you have this idea of a support system. Now, when you dive into the book of Proverbs, you'll find that a family needs to be that support system. It needs to be people who encourage one another and lift each other up and build each other up. It needs to be an environment of building up and praising one another. I find this in a couple of passages. For instance, Proverbs 31 verses 28 through 29. Um, I would encourage you to read the book of Proverbs chapter 31, um, especially here this latter part of the chapter where it talks about this virtuous woman. This virtuous woman is like a superstar. I mean, she's like super mom, uh, super wife, super businesswoman. Like she is very talented. And she seems like she never gets discouraged. I think the reason, one of the reasons, because this is mentioned a couple of times in this, in this section, and it kind of came out to me when I was studying, is that she is able to do everything she does because she has a strong intertwined support system. Listen to what her children and her husband do. Her children rise up and they call her blessed. They rise up and encourage her and build her up. Her husband also, he praises her. This, listen to what he says. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. What wife or husband or child wouldn't hear their, someone they love, whether it be their significant other or their parents or even their children praising you as a parent, say to them, you know, there are a lot of people who have done great, but mom, dad, son, daughter, you have just done the best. You're surpassing everybody. I am so proud of what you're doing. You see, that idea of encouragement, man, that goes a long way. Even back at the beginning of, of the section about the virtuous woman, the heart of her husband trusts her. He will have no lack of gain. In a support system, there is trust and praise and honor. If you want to talk about a a honor that goes among people. Think about the honor and the support that a woman can provide for her family. For instance, a wife to her husband. Every husband would be way more productive and loving and caring and kind if he had a wife that supported him, that built him up, that strengthened his reputation, that was kind to the poor and fearless about the future and speaks with wisdom and weighs her words before they leave her mouth. Every man would be so useful. Every man would be so encouraged. They would be so built up if they were surrounded by that. And that's one thing that I've learned in studying this book of Proverbs is that this virtuous woman, she was so uh, productive. She was so trusted. She was so loved because she had this support system around her. People that encouraged her and built her up. And she was that to other people. She enhanced her husband's reputation. She used wisdom when she spoke. She worked hard because she had people around her that would support her. Folks, our families need to be support systems. We've got to support one another 
as best we can, especially within the family. The family should be an environment of building up and praising one another, giving that attention that is due to one another. If you just do a little study, like for instance, into adultery, and you look at the statistics of women and men who get involved in affairs outside of marriage, it is, it is astounding how many of those affairs take place. Now, of course, not all of them happen this way. So some people are just unfaithful and, and that's unfortunate, but a, a good majority of them happen because somewhere in that marriage, somebody is not caring for, supporting, or loving. They're not giving praise to, honor where it's deserved. There, there is a, uh, something missing in that marriage. And so this person, it, 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 they need that praise. They need that honor. They need that encouragement and that building up. And then they may be at work and they get it from somebody else. And that's when affairs begin. And it moves from there. That, that need in a home, it's felt outside of the home and an affair takes place. When we talk about the home, it wouldn't take long for you and I to come up with a laundry list of problems that someone in our home has. If you're married, if your spouse, just, just think about your spouse, it wouldn't take you long to come up with a laundry list of things they do wrong. But if we're going to be a support system around our family, we have to focus on the good and suffocate out the bad. And I think that's why this Proverbs 31 woman was so successful. Um, so Proverbs 31 teaches me that. I had a couple of more passages that I think I forgot to put into um, our PowerPoint here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to pull up my Bible and show them to you real quick. Um, let me see here. I'm going to pull up my Bible and uh, share them with you. Sorry, it's going to take me just a second. Okay, here we go. This should be the Bible app that you're seeing. All right, let's look at another passage, Proverbs 12 and verse 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. So a woman who supports her husband and, and, and is, is encouraging to him and praises him, she's the crown of her husband. But what about the woman that brings shame to him, that shames him, some translations say. Uh, some scholars think that this verse is actually indicating a woman who shames her husband and she's always tearing him down and always saying what he's doing wrong and, you know, to, to the people around them, they're always sharing what's wrong with their spouse versus what, what they're doing right. She brings shame. She's like a rottenness in his bones. Instead of being the crown, an outward display of their beautiful relationship, she is rotting him from the inside out. What a, what a terrible uh, illustration there. But that's the case in Proverbs chapter 12. Look over in Proverbs 14. Proverbs chapter, let's see, bring it up 14 and verse 1. The wisest of women builds her house, but the folly with her own hands tears it down. So a wise woman is going to take her words and her actions, and she's going to build it up, build her home up. But a foolish woman, the folly of a woman, she's going to take her own hands and tear it down. Our home should be that which is uh, building each other up, encouraging one another, not tearing each other down. Okay, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8 over to Proverbs 1 and verse 8. Listen to how the husband talks about himself and his wife. Hear my husband, uh, hear my son, your father's instruction, forsake not your mother's teaching. Not only is he encouraging the son to listen to his words, but he's, he's lifting up his wife by saying, listen to what she has to say as well. Her teaching is equally as valuable. Don't forsake her teaching either. You see, that, that's an environment of praise and lifting up. I, I hope that point makes sense. Um, for our first one. Okay, let me go back to my PowerPoint and uh, we'll pull that back up here. So uh, the first thing is that a, 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 a home built on wisdom is a support system. I hope you see that in those passages I brought out. Okay, the second one is that a home built on wisdom has diversified provision. So let me explain, explain what I mean by diversified provision. What would you say are the necessities of life? You know, a lot of people would say a lot of different things are necessary. They are necessities in life. Some people would say, you know, food, clothing, uh, a roof over our head, all that is a necessity in life. Now, most people would feel that also other things would be necessities, things that we would consider today luxuries, the finer things of life, especially uh, parents providing for children. They look at things that are, are not necessities, they're luxuries, and they look at them as if they're necessities. Um, things like, uh, you know, extracurricular stimulation and 
education for their children that's going to promote them in life. Now, I'm not saying that any of these things don't have merit, but what I'm saying is when we talk about provision in a family, providing the necessities should come below these necessities. We're talking about food, clothing, uh, shelter, extracurricular, uh, education. All of those things should fall under the provisions I'm about to share. And, and I think the book of Proverbs brings this out. The first one is the most important one. And, uh, I, you know, I talk about this a lot and I hope, uh, I hope you all understand what I mean when I talk about this, but the first kind of provision that is the most important in a family is spiritual provision, more important than riches, more important than necessities, even more important than food and clothing is the spiritual provision of a family. That is, we're showing our children who God is and what God does for us and that we should serve him faithfully and teaching them about God. Now, the provision that we give our families here ultimately springboards our families later in life. That's especially true of children. What provision we give them in the areas I'm talking about here will springboard them later in life. Think about Proverbs 15 and verse 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with he said, it's better for you to have less and fear and be faithful to God than great treasure and trouble with it. In fact, the Bible does tell me, you know, when we talk about necessities, food and water and clothing, when it comes to those things, if I'm seeking God faithfully, the Bible promises me that God's going to provide that stuff, which should be encouraging to me. So it's better to have a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. So let's talk about what the fear of the Lord provides, because we as parents want to provide our children with the fear of the Lord. But, you know, sometimes we phrase it this way, I'm going to put the fear of God in you. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fear of the Lord as we defined it at the beginning of these series of lessons as being the idea, understanding that God exists. He's all powerful. He has love and wrath and expectations for us. And we should live under that umbrella of knowing who God is, that he exists. It's, it's the same idea of living a godly life in the New Testament. So what does fearing the Lord provide for us? If we give our children this idea of the fear of the Lord, we introduce them to God and provide them with the fear of the Lord, what does it help them do? Well, Proverbs 1 and verse 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if we provide our children with the fear of the Lord, that knowledge is, is a stepping stone. That's where you're going to really jump off into the, the, the unknown abyss or the depth of, of knowing God, it begins with the fear of the Lord, which is something that must be in a family. It's better to have little with the fear of the Lord than have a lot and much trouble with it. Well, we don't want that. So we need to be providing our families with the fear of the Lord. That's a spiritual provision. Not only this, the fear of the Lord gives me a long life. Proverbs 10 and verse 27 says, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. Now, we know that Proverbs is a truism. So, you know, there are people who are faithful to God whose lives are shorter. And that's not what Proverbs 10, 27 is saying. What Proverbs 10, 27 is saying is that fearing the Lord prolongs your life. You're not going to be as idiotic. You're not going to make such uh, impulsive decisions as you would not fearing the Lord. It helps you to lead a good life is what Proverbs 10 and verse 27 tells me. Fear of the Lord helps our children and our families to avoid sin. When we focus on God and our families and we provide them with spiritual support, it's going to help our families avoid sin. By the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil, Proverbs 16 and verse 6. If I am focusing my family and providing them spiritual support as the number one provision, then they are going to be better off in serving God. Not only that, uh, should we focus on spiritual provision? Not only that, but we should also focus, secondly, on loving provision, loving provision. We need to provide an environment for our family where love reigns supreme, that it's more important than providing for them material abundance. You know, it's true, the statistics ring it out, that kids who come from families and homes where love is lacking, where, uh, you know, a father didn't love his children enough to stick around, or a mother doesn't love them enough to train them and teach them, that children that come from these homes are more likely to have trouble in life. And I think all of us understand that, that that's, that's a potential reality. And so we need to be providing loving homes. Loving, it goes hand in hand with the spiritual. If I love my children, I'm going to give them spiritual instruction. Proverbs 15 and verse 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox where hatred is. 
I would rather have little. I don't know if you've ever had a dinner of herbs. It doesn't sound too good for me. I've grown herbs before. I've grown basil and uh, we've grown uh, chives and we've grown all kinds of stuff like that. And it's not really going to be a real nutritious meal, but you know what? I know what the Proverbs writer says, better is it when you have just a little bit to get you by and you got love than to have everything you could want for sustenance and your family and home is filled with hatred. You would rather have love and less than hate and more. Um, I don't want to have hate and more. I would rather have love and less. And so Proverbs 15 and verse 17 kind of rings true in that area. Uh, lo love is something that is taught at home. And as I actually begin to investigate and search through this idea, teaching love at home helps in other areas of life. Like for instance, here in Proverbs 17, teaching love at home helps our families to develop strong friendships and trust outside of the home. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but one who repeats a matter separates close friends. That is, love is best taught first at home. When you teach love and you teach care for one another and trust, then you're going to springboard your family into having strong friendships and trust later because the home is built on love. Not only that, learning to love at home brings a consistency or a reliability. Our society needs more people who are consistent and reliable that when you call, they're going to be there. When you need them, they will be right there to help you. We need more consistent reliability. Steadfast love and faithfulness preserve the king. By steadfast love, his throne is upheld. How does a king have longevity and consistency and reliability? That king has that when he has steadfast love and faithfulness. And love is first learned at home. That's where we need to start it. A home that's built on wisdom is a loving home. Even Jesus teaches us the importance of love. Love is first taught to children at home. Love is best communicated uh, out in the world when at home I'm getting love from my spouse. It's a fundamental part of the, the framework of the godly wise home. Not only that, but love teaches us conflict resolution, right? Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Nobody stirs up more problems than someone who's just hateful, right? someone's hateful, they're going to stir up so much issues everywhere they go. Those issues are going to follow them all throughout their life. But love, man, love is going to calm things down. They're going to help offenses get dealt with and, and push them away. There is enough craziness in this world that our families need more love. So we need spiritual provision and loving provision. Not only that, but peaceful. This is just kind of a quick point, but I found these passages in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 17 and verse 1, better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. The same idea, I would rather have just not a super nutritious, not a really great dinner with quiet than a house that is full of feasting and food and all this great stuff, but there's strife everywhere. We need peace in our homes and peace is first taught at home. Listen to Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will find a refuge. Our homes should be places of peace where we can go and get away from the world. I said this a moment ago. There's enough craziness in the world. We need in our homes to have places of safety, security, stability. That is what our home needs. And that's a loving, provi providing home. All of those things having peace at home and teaching children they can have safety from the world, having a loving home where we care for one another and, and, and treat one another with respect, having a spiritually sounded and grounded home is way more important than any material uh, possession or any material provision. Now, material provision is important, and that's, that's, that's the responsibility of a father to provide for his family. But when we talk about provision, there are other provisions that are more important than material. And I think Proverbs brings that out. Our final point tonight is that a home that is built on wisdom is a home that has God at the center, a home that has God at the center. Now, when we talk about God being at the center of our home, I want you to hear what Proverbs chapter 24 says. This was the passage that kind of prompted the naming of this lesson. By wisdom, a house is built and by understanding it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. You see, a home, he says, is built on wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Where do wisdom, understanding, and knowledge even come from? Proverbs 2 and verse 6 says, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So if I want to build a home, 
I need to use the resources God has given me, wisdom and knowledge and understanding. In other words, my family, my home, my life needs to be centered around God. Our world's gotten in so much trouble because people haven't centered their life around God. So as a, as a home, everything we do needs to be centered around God. Here's just a few examples. We're actually going to dive into some of these subjects more through our topical study, but I just love these ideas here of being centered on God. Here's the first one. Uh, the idea of committing our works, Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit your works to the Lord. Everything you do needs to be dedicated to the Lord, and your plans will be established. If we commit everything we do in our homes to the Lord, everything will be A-OK. -okay. Here's an example. God should be at the center of my finances, Proverbs 3, verses 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty your vats will be bursting with wine. It's important for you and I to remember when it comes to finances that God gets what's first. And let me share something that might not be popular with every person. Um, I may have shared this with Bowden before. God should get of my first fruits before the government does. That is, the government should not get the biggest portion of my income. If the government's getting the biggest portion of my income, then there's a problem. There's an unequal distribution of wealth and, and uh, distribution of my riches and my first fruits. Honor God with your wealth and with their first fruits. That is who gets what's first out of my finances. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deeds. My finances need to center around being generous as the Bible teaches me. God being the center of my finances teaches that. Okay, what else? My home, God should be at the center of our speech. Proverbs 12 and verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Nobody in this life outside of God knows who you are by your speech better than your family. So if there's hypocrisy or inconsistencies in your speech, your family's going to know it before anybody else. That's super valuable. We shouldn't sacrifice the consistencies of what we tell our family to be able to put on a good front in front of others. Our speech should be consistent. We need to act faithfully as God's delight. Prayer should be at the center of my home, and that means God's at the center of my home. Proverbs 15, 8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. How often do you pray together as a family? That's just a question that I want you to ponder. Another one is our actions towards others. God should be at the center of our home, and people should see that, especially our families. Don't say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord. He will deliver you. Our families, more than anybody else, knows how we treat others. God should be at the center of my actions. That's a great thing to want. And it's a great thing for people to see. Not only that, what about my aspirations? Our family sees this. At the center of our home shouldn't be envy of sinners. Let not your heart envy sinners. We shouldn't envy what they have, what they do, their freedom, whatever the world lies to us about. Don't envy that, but continue in the fear of the Lord all day. Man, there is so much that's here in this book of Proverbs for families, but I hope these three things have helped you. The first is our family should be a support system. We should encourage one another, lift one another up. The second is that we should have provision in our families. We should provide spiritually loving and peacefully for all the people in our families. The final point is that God should be at the center of our family, and that's the greatest provision we can provide for them. By putting God at the center of our family, we're going to set them on a path towards heaven. That's the end of our lesson tonight. That's what Proverbs, in short, has to say about families. That's not even close to everything, nor is it exhaustive, but I hope this has helped. I hope you have studied this material, and maybe it has helped you in some way, whatever the case. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for listening in, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.